As we begin today, I'll just go ahead and get the suspense out of the way. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. (laughs) But as I was sitting even and worshiping this morning, I was so thankful for the music ministry and for Joel's leadership. I was so thankful that God has gifted men and women over the years to write such wonderful songs that focus my heart. Because coming here in this service for this little bit of time, as I thought about one word as I was going through my mind just now, the word distractions kept coming up. That's what I like about Sunday morning. For at least this one hour and change per week, some of the distractions that afflict my mind are set aside. We live in a society that is very distracting. There is something available to catch our attention every hour of the day, every minute of the hour, and it never stops. I think back to my childhood when I was a little kid. We only had one TV channel, and it only was on for part of the day. I can remember as a kid waking up before anybody else and sitting and watching the test patterns, just waiting. At some point, TV was going to come on. I couldn't wake anybody else up, so I'd just sit and watch the test patterns. At some point, it would eventually play the national anthem, and the day would start. Kids today don't have that, and I realize some of you started life without TV. But our minds are constantly bombarded by things other than Jesus Christ. For some reason, a song we've sung many times before just was really riveting my attention this morning. There is only one God. There is only one mediator between God and man. That should consume our thoughts. And pointing other people to that one God, that one mediator should consume our thoughts, but we are easily distracted. God is the sovereign of the universe. We praise him for that. But for a time, he's allowed Satan to have a certain amount of latitude on the earth. And I am convinced that Satan spends his time using distractions to destroy us. Even preparing for this message was a daily battle not to be distracted. First, I have me to deal with. The issues that I go through and that I think about and then the Olympics are on (laughs) that's really distracting particularly when we're winning gold medals and it's no secret college football is about to start and Florida State's quarterback broke his foot yesterday I got to pay attention to that (laughs) I'm a baseball fan and don't get me started about politics I can't get this out of my head But our minds are really supposed to be focused. What God wants from his children is for us to set aside the distractions, whatever their source, and to focus on him. And it's hard to do. When you think about how Jesus described salvation, he talked about there being a narrow path that few people find and a wide path that's crowded going to destruction. I'm convinced it's filled with distractions on the way to destruction. I was teaching in my Sunday school class this morning. I forgot to shut my cell phone off. I heard the beep of an email. Or it was a text, one or the other. The distractions never stop. And even though the Bible was written 2,000 years ago, life was still the same. The nature of the distractions might have been somewhat different with electronics being what they are today versus the absence of them then. But life was still life. Waking up still involved looking in the mirror and seeing a sinful reflection. 
and then working through the day dealing with other sinners and having the trials of life of not enough food or not enough money and a hostile government and a bad government and a government that had ungodly leadership. And just as now, there were countless people that were tracking after God, but not the one God. They were running after religion, but not in the only way to find salvation, which is through Jesus Christ. And the Bible was written, I believe, in part to focus us, to help us to see clearly when all around us is chaos that can give us a neck aid as we look from one thing to the other to the other and miss what God's calling us to do. Fascinating. For some people, the distractions result in their damnation because they're so caught up in other things, they never actually have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They might say, Lord, Lord, but when they stand before Jesus, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. All the religious busyness wasn't for me. And as we find ourselves in the book of Hebrews, I'm teaching through as I have opportunities to preach. I happen to be in Hebrews chapter 11. It occurred to me that the reason these things are here are to focus our minds. I've taught through Hebrews for a long time. I'm teaching through Hebrews chapter 11 as I have opportunities to preach. And I've already covered a lot of the material. Everything that I read to you this morning, with the exception of verses 11 and 12, I've taught. But the reason Hebrews chapter 11 is in your, in your Bible is because of what Hebrews chapter 12 says. If you just look in your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I think every time I've taught out of Hebrews 11, I've read this verse because it's so pertinent. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us, lay aside, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All of chapter 11 is designed to help us fix our eyes on Jesus. To stay focused even in the midst of chaos, which is what our world is right now. It's an interesting analogy, but I happened to be watching one of the sprinting races yesterday, and I was watching it, and as one of the sprinters was making it to the finish line, before he got to the finish line, he looked to his left at other runners. And the commentators, of course, commented, oh, well, you can't ever do that. You can't look away. The race isn't over. You got to keep your head focused until the race is over. Well, I was thinking we're like that runner. We're not anywhere near the finish line, but we're looking everywhere else. And the author of Hebrews is telling us, Jesus is the finish line. You keep your eyes fixed on him. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 is supposed to do, is help us fix our eyes on Jesus and I think our verses this morning are going to further that task. I read that longer section. Verses 11 and 12 are going to be our study this morning. I'm going to reread them right now, and I'll probably reread them again later. But it says, By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. I'm going to say a lot of things about these verses. I'm going to say a lot of things about Abraham and Sarah. But remember, all of this is supposed to focus us back on Jesus. We have a race to run. We're not Olympians. But in God's eyes, we have a course to complete. And the way that we do it is by fixing our eyes on the finish line, which is Jesus Christ. 
And as we go, we want to help others get to the finish line and we want to point the lost to the finish line. Point them to Jesus. So as I thought through teaching these verses from the life of Abraham and Sarah, I think we're going to see two principles for keeping your eyes on Jesus. That's why these are in the Bibles, to help us keep our eyes on Jesus. So from this, I developed two principles for keeping your eyes on Jesus. Now, before I jump completely into the text, just a little context as I normally do. The book of Hebrews was written, written to people from a Jewish background who had come to place their faith in Christ. They were raised Jewish, but now they proclaim Jesus to be the Messiah. And these were real believers who had endured real hardship. They had faced persecutions and endured them, persecutions that I think, unfortunately, may be coming to us in our country. But they had already endured them. They had stood strong, but for some reason, some of them were wobbling now. Some were tempted to either leave Christianity and go back to Judaism, or maybe they wanted to bring Judaism and put it on top of Christianity so you had Jesus plus something else. And the book of Hebrews is designed to encourage and correct and warn. It's supposed to encourage believers to keep pressing forward, fixing our eyes on Jesus. But it's supposed to warn those who are tempted to look elsewhere that there is no other way. It's Jesus. It's not Judaism. It's not the Old Testament sacrifices. It's only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. These people had suffered. They had endured hardship. And they needed to persevere. And so the writer spends a great time, deal of time, particularly through, from chapters 5 through 10 in our English Bibles, a big chunk of that was dealing with the theology that Jesus is all you need. He's sufficient. He's the one mediator between God and man. There is nothing else you need. But then the writer in chapter 11 starts transitioning a little bit from theology to try and give some practical help to the individuals who need to put one foot in front of the other and follow Christ. That's where we find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 11. And the writer is talking in this context about faith. It's a faith that he assumes his hearers already have. If they know Jesus Christ, they possess this faith. Faith, it is a gift from God. And it's this faith that enables them to do what God calls them to do. And it's the faith that enables us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 11.1 1 describes what he means by faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Without re-preaching an older sermon, it really means believing God. God promised it, God will deliver, period. Faith is believing God with total confidence based on who he is, not based on the evidence that we can hold up in our hands. Not based on some scientific experiment, it's based on God and his character, And as I mentioned already, one of the examples that God gives us relates to Abraham and Sarah. These are individuals who exercise the faith in God that we need to exercise. And they're being put forth in our scriptures this morning as an example to us so that we can follow their example. Verses 8 through 10 talk about a circumstance where Abraham had followed God. God said, go. He didn't tell him where. And Abraham said, okay. He immediately obeyed. And scriptures tell us that Sarah went with him. But from that historical event in Abraham's life, our verses this morning at verses 11 and 12 deal with another historical event in his life. And it's this historical event that's going to show us the two principles for keeping your eyes on Jesus. And the first principle is this. Focus on God's promises, not your limitations. Focus on God's promises, not your limitations. Verse 11 again says this. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. 
A couple of years ago when I was first studying this text, as most of you know, the reason I'm preached through Hebrews is because I taught through the entire book of my Sunday school class, so I've studied this material. When I first studied it a couple of years ago, I came to this verse and I saw, by faith, that's what you see at every verse, by faith, by faith, by faith. And I thought, oh, this is easy. The next example is Sarah. But when I started studying the text, I found out through my studies that it's actually a very controversial two verses. That people have debated for a long time what's an issue here. And when I first went through this, I spent a lot of time talking about that controversy to my Sunday school class. There's a lot of scholarly debate. There's a lot of scholarly explanations of things. And it is interesting to read through. But as I studied more to prepare for today, and as I spent a time going through my prior teaching, I realized I spent so much time on the controversy, I missed the point of the text. You never want to do that when you're teaching. I spent so much time talking about all these things and what I thought it meant that I missed what did God mean. More study has led me to the conclusion I didn't fully do justice to the text, and I don't want to repeat that mistake this morning. So I'm going to tell you it's controversial, but I'm not going to get into all the details because I don't think they're as relevant as I once did. It all comes down to, is verse 11 talking about Sarah, which most English translations say, or is verse 11 talking about Abraham, which if you look, you'll find some English translations that say, by faith, Abraham. And the more I've studied and the more I've seen it, I realize I don't think it's an either or. I think both Abraham and Sarah are in view in this context. Sarah is a focal point, but also Abraham is a focal point. The verses immediately preceding involve Abraham. The incident itself, which we will talk about, involved a promise made to Abraham directly by God. And verse 12 references Abraham. But Sarah is a part of this as well. And so I think the ultimate issue is that Abraham and Sarah are for us examples, as I will explain as I go through this. This one event in both of their lives is supposed to help us fix our eyes on Jesus as we see how they appropriated their faith to believe God. Yet as we go through this, and you'll have to bear with me because it might seem like I'm getting off track, but I don't think I am. You're going to find some comfort in the fact that Abraham and Sarah, even though they're held up to us as examples of faith, were not superhuman. They were real people with real struggles and real failures just like us. And I think their failures and struggles give us hope because we're not superhuman. We look in the mirror and we know how much we struggle. I think we identify with the Apostle Paul who said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. And a verse like this is supposed to help us get focused. So I pray as we look more closely at the text that we will be encouraged to fix our eyes on Jesus as we see two fallible humans who had to do the same thing. Now again, verse 11 is dealing with a specific point in history when Sarah had a child. We're going to look a lot in the Old Testament this morning. You can't cover these verses without doing so. But the historical event, if you've been in church very long, is something familiar. Abraham was promised by God that he would have a son. The son was Isaac, and eventually that son was born. That's what verse 11 is talking about. That's what verses 12 is talking about. It's a done deal. It already happened. There was a real man, Abraham, a real woman, Sarah, and God helped them have a baby. The baby's name was Isaac. But there's a lot more that goes into that. Because these verses encapsulate a moment in time of two individuals who took a long time to get there, who struggled with believing God, 
In fact, as you look through it, and I think you'll see as I go through some background material today, you'll see that quite often Abraham and Sarah's lives are not necessarily virtuous. More than one time, they engaged in behavior where we would scratch our heads and say, huh? In that respect, they're a lot like us. Now, again, I want to be clear. Abraham and Sarah are both in heaven. They're of faith. God used Abraham to found his chosen people, the nation of Israel. Genesis 15, 6 sums it up. Then he believed in the Lord, and he, meaning God, reckoned it to him, Abraham, as righteousness. Abraham was genuinely saved. And 1 Peter chapter 3 makes it clear that Sarah is a saved woman. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 say, For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being mis- submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Sarah's described as one of the holy women. She's a believer. She's an example for women. But the fact remains, as we go through our study this morning, you're going to see these are real people. These are not caricatures. One of the things that has always struck me as a proof of the Bible's truthfulness is that it doesn't paper over the faults of its heroes. It puts them on display. It doesn't cover up the fact that King David, a man after God's own heart, engaged in adultery and murder doesn't cover up the very real sinful actions of Abraham and Sarah. It will seem like I'm doing a full biography on their lives. Let me assure you, I don't have time to cover everything. But I do want to cover some information so that you can understand when we come to Hebrews chapter 11, when we see verses 11 and 12, there's a lot more to this than just the accomplished act. Because getting to the point where Abraham and Sarah had faith in God was a journey, not an instantaneous thing. Now, when Abraham and Sarah are first mentioned in Scripture, Abram was Abraham's name and Sarai was Sarah's name. God eventually changed their names. But Abraham and Sarah are first put together when they first come on the scene, their husband and wife. In Genesis chapter 11... And I'll give you these references. I'm going to spend a lot of time in Genesis. Genesis chapter 11, verses 29 and 30, we meet Sarai. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Niscah. Sarai was barren. She had no child. That's critical truth for our text this morning. Sarah could not have kids. She was barren. We learn from other parts of Scripture there was about a 10-year age gap between Abraham and Sarah. But Sarah couldn't have kids. I'll talk about it later. She was a very beautiful woman. But it had to be a source of heartache that throughout her life, throughout her married life, she could not have children. Now, in verses 8 and through 10 of Hebrews chapter 11, we see that example where Abram was called and he went. He went willingly. God said, go. He went. He didn't ask where. God said, I'll show you later. Abraham just obeyed. And Sarah went along with him. Around that time, Abraham was probably about 75 That's deduction from various scriptures in Genesis 11 and Genesis 12. At one point it says he was 75. If you look at the series of events, he probably was there. Sarah was about 65. And God made promises to this man and this woman that were impossible. But even in calling Abraham, God said, I'm going to do something special with you. 
I covered when I taught through this. Abraham was raised in a pagan family. His father worshipped other gods. But at some point, God got a hold of him such that he did believe God. But he had a weak faith at times. These two individuals that are held up for us as pillars and godly examples, which they are, had a lot of very human failures. I don't want to highlight these to talk bad about them. There's nothing to talk bad about them. I want to highlight them so you understand that this example comes from people who are just like you and me. God's not going to use us to start an entire nation, but when it comes to humanity and our sinful tendencies, they had the same as you and me. It's interesting. God had called Abraham. God had already revealed himself. Abraham knew who God was. Abraham was listening to God and following God. But there's an account when he was 75 where he moved to Egypt. There was a famine and for various reasons he moved his family there. You could find it in Genesis chapter 12. But this man who God was going to use to do remarkable things had very human reaction. He was married to a beautiful woman and he said, "Hmm, we're going to this country. People are going to see my wife. She's pretty. They're going to kill me because they'll want to marry my wife. And so at that point, what did he do? Did he pray to God and say, God, protect me? God, I trust you. My life is in your hands? No. He said, Sarah, let's lie. Pretend like you're not my wife. I don't want to get killed. Rather than trust God, who had already come to him, Abraham responded, unfortunately, like a lot of us would. He was scared and tried to figure out a way to protect himself. So not only did he lie, but he got his wife to lie. And but for God's intervention, there could have been all kinds of catastrophe. And yet God didn't give up on Abraham because he failed. He didn't give up on Sarah because she failed. In Genesis 15, as you follow a biblical pattern, you see God reiterating again to Abraham something he had already done. This is really an elaboration and a further affirmation of a promise already made. And we read the end of this little section before Abraham believed in the Lord and he reckoned him as righteousness. But basically, God was promising him, you're going to have a child, but there was some dialogue. Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Verse 2. Abraham, Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. In other words, God, I don't have any kids. You promised me these great things. It's not going to happen without kids. I don't have it. Somebody else outside my house is my heir. Verse 3, and Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. You haven't given me kids, so it's a relative. Verse 4, then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And it says immediately following a, then he believed in the Lord, meaning Abram believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it him as righteousness. It's a critical issue. Abram, Abraham did believe God. And God promised him, it's not somebody else. You're going to have a natural child. But Abraham was already old, but God promised it. So from that point forward, Genesis chapter 15 on, Abraham was a man of faith, right? That's why we have him in Hebrews chapter 11. It's not that way. Abraham did believe God, but he didn't always trust him. And he didn't always act on his word. Fascinating to me, looking at the lives of those two weak people that God used in an amazing way. God holds them up for us and says, follow their example of faith. He's not holding up their sinful actions for us to follow those But he puts them out there so we don't have any illusion that these were somehow different types of people than us. Well, I can't do those things because they were, no, they were just like us. They were sinners. In fact, Genesis 16 records an ugly, ugly incident. Ugly from the standpoint of the sanctity of marriage. Fascinating. Abraham obviously had told Sarah God's promises. She knew them. 
God had promised Abraham, you're going to have your own descendants. I'm going to take care of it. But in Genesis chapter 16, summarizing it, it looks like Sarah decided God wasn't moving fast enough. So she decided to help out the process and get things moving a little bit because she really wanted a kid and she wasn't having one. She had heard promises. She still had no children. So she took matters into her own hands. I'll just stop for a second and ask you, have you ever gotten impatient with God? (laughs) Tired of waiting on him to do what he promised to do? Well, then I'll just step in and I'll fix things. I'll help God. I'll, I'll push the issue along a little bit. Maybe God's taking care of something else right now. No. Sarah got herself in all kinds of trouble. In fact, she did something that still has repercussions today. She told Abraham, why don't you sleep with my maid, Hagar, and then her child will be credited to me. Remember, Abraham believed God. So this man of faith said, no, Sarah, I love you. You're my wife. No, he didn't do that. He did sleep with Hagar. And it produced a child, Ishmael, who would produce his own descendants, who would always be at enmity with the child of promise and his descendants. Abraham listened to Sarah, and their actions were both sinful, and it created heartache. Certainly doesn't reflect trusting God. If anything, it looks like outright distrust. Abraham was about 86 when this occurred, according to Genesis 16, 16, and it had horrible repercussions. Again, Abraham and Sarah don't look good so far. They're stumbling and they're lying and they're being impatient and they've engaged in immoral actions. And then in Genesis 17, we see the history coming along further, but God didn't give up on them. Praise the Lord that God doesn't give up on sinful saints because we'd be in trouble. But Genesis 17 records that when Abraham was 99, God came to him again and reiterated the promise. Now, if I were to connect the biblical dots, probably Abraham was about 75 the first time God had said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you descendants. So this is almost 25 years later. It's a long time to wait. But God gives Abraham another chance to believe. Genesis 17, verse 15 and 16, we read this. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nation. Kings of people will come from her. This is a very specific promise. Abraham was 99. The 10-year difference means Sarah was 89. They were not in the childbearing prime of life. And so when this occurred, for a hero of the faith, you assume that what he did was he said, thank you, God, for reiterating the promise. I forgot. Forgive me. I love you, Lord. I trust you. We read something different in Genesis 17, verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old and will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael, the one son he did have, might live before you. In other words, God, you got this all messed up. I'm 100, practically. Sarah's 90, What are you talking about? Ishmael, he's the one. Verse 19, but God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I'll establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Were there limitations on Abraham and Sarah? Of course there were. Their bodies didn't work anymore. They weren't capable of producing a child in any natural way. And so Abraham's response, even though God had promised him almost 25 years before this is going to happen, Abraham by this point had given up believing. 
He had waited so long, he thought, well, it must be Ishmael. He laughed at God. From a time perspective, I'm just going to summarize something. But God came again in Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 to 15. And the angel of the Lord, probably the pre-incarnate Christ, was talking to Abraham. And basically said, I'm going to come back next year and Sarah's going to have a son. And it says Sarah was listening at the tent door. In verse 12, she laughed to herself. Her reaction was the same as Abraham's. <laughs> yeah, right. Been waiting 25 years for this promise to be fulfilled, and you're going to say this foolishness? Verse 13 says something interesting. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? God hears everything. God knows. Verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Verse 15, it's interesting. Sarah did what I promise you most of us would have done. Sarah denied it. I didn't laugh. For she was afraid. God wasn't fooled. No, you laughed. She not only laughed and disbelieved the promise, just like her husband, but she tried to lie to God about it. They both laughed. They both disbelieved God. And I think in that moment, we can identify with them. Some of you have been there. Some of you are there. Where you know God promised something, but it's been so long, you just give up. You hear a pastor preaching a sermon saying, this applies to you, and you just think, it's past time for me. Maybe 20 years ago, but no. This has got to be for someone else. Don't you understand the limitations of my situation? I can't really do much at all for God. But Hebrews 11, 11 and 12 says that God used two stumbling, bumbling sinners who distrusted God and who disbelieved his word. Even though they believed, they disbelieved. Reminded of the man who Jesus said, do you believe? And he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's the cry of my heart so often. I think it was the cry of Abraham and Sarah's heart. Except at that point, they had given up like some of you may have. Verse 11 of Hebrews 11 says, By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. That really comes down to the core of everything for us. This really gets back to how do we, despite all of our failures and our stumbles and falls and our foolishness, how do we get our focus back on Jesus? How do we fix our eyes on him? At some point, Abraham and Sarah took their eyes off of their physical bodies. They took their eyes off of their limitations and they finally said, you know what? We're going to trust God, even though it makes no sense. Even though they had both laughed in God's face, even though they both had waited 25 years, what seemed like futility to them, they finally came to the time where they considered that God who had promised was faithful recognize that Abraham and Sarah had to have sexual relations to produce Isaac think it's possible to understand from the language that that part of their life had already stopped they finally though exercised faith Genesis 21 really brings everything to fruition 
Sarah did conceive just like God said, and she did have a son just as God had promised. And when Abraham was 100 years old, the man who had laughed in God's face held a baby boy. Eventually, despite their doubts, despite their distrust, despite their limitations of their own physical bodies, at some point they said, we trust you, God. And God came through. They became the parents of a nation. I won't read it for time's sake, but go to Isaiah 51. It holds up Abraham and Sarah. They produced a nation that God would use. Let me encourage you today to believe the promises of God. Set beside you the number of times you disbelieved. I know that struggle. Well, God, I can't. I've got this circumstance. I've got that circumstance. Focus on God's promises, not your limitations. I think we're more like Abraham and Sarah than we realize when we look at the number of times they doubted, the number of times they disbelieved. They knew better, and yet their sinful heart still led them astray. Understand this. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not sitting on the sidelines. Period. Every single person that God reaches down and saves has a work to do for the kingdom of God. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Our good works don't save us, but once we're saved, God has work for us to do. Some of us aren't doing the work because we doubt. And we believe the lie that our limitations somehow bind God. If God is calling you to do something, act in faith. Don't look at what you can't do. Look at who God is. There are countless ways that play out. And for each one of them is different. Not everybody is called to the same thing. I felt called to be a pastor, so I left a one career and went to a new career. Not everybody has that calling, but God might call you to be a better parent to your kids. Embrace it. Don't be limited by your past failures. Embrace moving forward. God might be calling you to do something related to missions. Don't go by your past failures or the limitations of, well, I'm too old or I don't have enough money. Trust God. If he's calling you there, he'll do the work. Maybe you're in a tough situation where your boss wants you to compromise or lie or cheat and you've got to do it to save your job and you think, well, I really don't have a choice. God promises to take care of my needs, but I need this job. Trust God. Don't look at your limitations. I don't want this to be a condemning message. I want it to encourage you like it's encouraging me because when I look in the mirror, I don't see your failures. I see my own. And I realize that God uses fallen, fallible creatures that he's redeemed to do the work he's called them to do. How many times have you failed God? How many times have you not believed God? How many times have you doubted God? How many times have you laughed at the sermon because you thought that can't apply to me? Put that all behind you and trust God. Like Abraham and Sarah, come to the place where you can lay aside all the distractions in your life and you can focus on Jesus and the promise of his word. So the first principle for keeping your eyes on Jesus, focus on God's promises, not your limitations. The second, which comes from verse 12, is this. Remember God's power, not your potential. Remember God's power, not your potential. Verse 12 says something fascinating. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good 
as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Here's the practical reality. Abraham's body was spent, period. From a procreation standpoint, his body was as good as dead. And yet God took this man whose body was spent and allowed to be born from him countless descendants just as he had promised. There's a reference that Abraham had descendants, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sandwiches by the seashore. If you look at the version that I read out of, all those letters are in capital letters. Normally, when you see capital letters like that, it's a quotation from the Old Testament. In this context, it's not quoting a specific verse. It's quoting a series of verses where all of them, God is promising Abraham and telling him, look, can you count the stars? We read that before. Can you count the stars? You're going to have that many descendants. The sand on the seashore, you go to the beach, there's a lot of sand, a lot of grains of sand. You're going to have descendants like that. The point that God was making was that I'll take your dead body and I'll still make a nation out of you. The issue is God's power. It wasn't Abraham's potential. He had zero potential. If God was going to build a nation out of potential, he wouldn't pick a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman. He'd Pick a couple of Olympians, 18-year-olds. Let's get some young, strong people. Isaac, take off running. Neither Abraham or Sarah can catch him. They're too old. They had no reproductive potential. They had no human potential to produce children that would turn into a nation, and God chose them anyway. God doesn't need the two Olympians. He can take two old people to do his will. Because the issue is God's power, not the inherent potential of the individual that God chooses. I think we can all be guilty of downplaying our potential to God. We see that throughout Scripture. Abraham laughing at God. Probably some of us have laughed when we thought God might be calling me to do this. Oh, there's no way. I'm too old. Or like... Moses, maybe God gives us an opportunity to share our faith and, well, God, I'm just not eloquent. I can't, I can't speak like that. Some other, body, some other person should do it. Well, we have a need for a missionary. Well, I can't give. I don't have any money. I can't give. I can't. I can't. I shouldn't. I don't have. I'm not. I'm not able. I'm too old. If that has permeated your thinking, let me tell you, Stop. Because the issue isn't you. The issue isn't me. The issue is God who called us. There's a mistake in Christianity at times. We are just like our world in that we like superstars. We like big names. We gravitate towards famous people. I remember hearing, I lived in California for a long time. I was saved in California. I remember hearing people say, well, if that person would come to faith, boy, that'd have a big impact because they're already famous and rich. That's not how God works. If you look in the mirror and say, I'm a nobody, welcome to God's family. That's who he chooses. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. Turn in your Bible if you have it there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. I think it's important for us, particularly if you've fallen into the trap of doubting and saying, well, I'm not the one. God can't really use me. He's got all these other people. And yeah, I heard Joe read Ephesians 2.10 that God created good works for me to do, but really, that time has passed. No, it hasn't. God knew what you were, and he knew your lack of potential when he saved you. Just like he did me. The Apostle Paul says this, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he might nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. 
So we're not mighty, we're not noble, we are foolish, we are base, we're the people that are not. God knew all that. Verse 30, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is particularly true today in our culture where we think everything is driven by popularity and numbers and stars. God knew you were nothing. He knew I was nothing. He called us because we were nothing. In fact, if you think that God called you because you were something, you might not have been called yet. Because God doesn't need us. Not in the sense of which we think that I've got such value that he wants me on his team It's not as though God and Satan are dividing up teams and God says, I need him. Okay, Satan, you can have that one. No. All of us are worthless. All of us are just dead sinners blindly marching down that broad road to hell and God pulls us out. He doesn't pull us out because of our potential. He pulls us out because of his power. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's the issue in our Christian walk. You want to focus on Jesus, forget yourself. It's God who's at work in us. Bringing about his perfect will in our lives. I want to encourage you today to lay aside distractions. You may have sidelined yourself because of your past failures. And if you haven't repented of your past failures, repent and turn to God. But if you've convinced yourself that God has something for other people to do but not you, you're mistaken. If God could use two older people who stumbled and bumbled and struggled to believe God even when God had promised and they lied and they disbelieved and they laughed in God's face, if you can identify with that kind of weakness, God can still use you. If God saved you, he has work for you to do and he's going to enable you to bring it to fruition. God didn't save you for nothing. If God saved you just to bring you to heaven, you wouldn't be hearing the sound of my voice. If you're here, it's because God has something for you. And I pray the example of Abraham and Sarah with their limitations and with their lack of potential will encourage you by helping you focus on God's promises and God's power, not your weakness. Please join me as I close our time in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are weak creatures. Lord, from the moment that we are saved, every one of us could write an encyclopedia of our failures, of the opportunity to witness for you and we kept quiet, of the opportunity to stand with integrity and we compromised, of the opportunity to walk by the Spirit when we instead indulged and the pleasures of the flesh. Lord, we are a motley group of individuals. If the world was looking for a people to make a difference, they wouldn't pick any of us, Lord. But we praise you that you chose us. Lord, you chose us in spite of who we are. And you've given us your promises and you've saved us by your power. All we can do is fall on our faces and say, thank you, we're not worthy. But Lord, I know a lot of times we get sidetracked by the struggle. We get distracted even by our own inadequacies. Lord, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us to daily focus on your word. Help us to daily reflect on your character and your power. And Lord, help us humbly 
walk the path you've set for us. Lord, even as I pray for strength for your children, I realize that there are a lot of people that think they're okay who one day will say to you, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these religious things? And you'll say, depart from them. Depart from you, rather. Lord, I pray if there are any here who are deceived about their salvation, that you would open their eyes this morning. That they would understand from the example of Abraham and Sarah that you don't choose wonderful people to save. You choose wretched sinners. And that if they've not come to the point where they recognize that before a holy God they stand condemned, I pray that you would help them have that awareness. But Lord, I also hope at that moment you would also show them Jesus that they would understand that he is the mediator. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty for sin for all who would ever believe. Pray that that would be real to another heart this morning. For the rest of us, Lord, give us strength. Even as we prepare to step out of this room and turn on our cell phones and turn on our TVs and turn on our car radios, we're going to be bombarded with the distractions that take our eyes off of Jesus. Lord, help us resist. Lord, we want to be a people who faithfully serve you. I pray that you would empower us to do that. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. We hope you will be back tonight at 6 p.m. You are dismissed.